we have to be cautious when we say something that's dangerous. But people sometimes create fear of, imp- of a danger that they create in their mind, meaning that their fear is an illusion in your mind, but danger is real. And you have to decide what is really real. In this case, what they've done is they've made COVID-19 into the thing that's dangerous. And it is not dangerous. But what is coming, the savior that's coming, which is the vaccine, is going to kill millions if they do it. Dr. Bittar does a phenomenal job at focusing people on issues which oftentimes are, they're not mysteries per se, but oftentimes they're outside the public consciousness, right? They're not part of the popular consciousness, I should say. Um, and so I think, I think he has a lot of success in, in getting people to t- attention arrested and focusing on something that they might not otherwise. Um, in some instances, I don't think it's unfair to say that he challenges his own progression um, by adding in a lot of cofactors, right? I mean, there's, there's quite a landscape that he covers, not just the, the COVID pieces, um, but, but he talks a lot about 5G. Uh, he talks a lot about uh, corruption in the medical establishment, all valid topics, frankly, uh, and all topics that uh, warrant you know, investigation and discussion. But sometimes it's like an avalanche and it's, and it's difficult to kind of parse um, how each of these things are related. Um, and so the, the great news is, is it gives you a lot to talk about and, and we can get into that here today. I think one of the things uh, that, that people need are resources and Dr. Pitar definitely fits the bill when it comes to that. I think the other guy um, that has done really quite a, a good job in this, in this domain as well is, is your friend and colleague, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Peter Atia. He's done, I think three podcasts in about as many weeks, uh, one with Dr. Peter Hotez, another one with Ryan Holiday, and I believe the third one was with uh, uh, Dr. Mike Wasserholm uh, that covers the, the COVID-19 landscape. Those podcasts are gold uh, because they're a deep and, and rich uh, well of information. Um, and in particular, in particular, on the epistemology of how we know what we know about COVID-19. So that's a great re- resource for people. Now, getting back to Dr. Bittar, Here's the thing that I think he just, he nails, which is he brings your attention to the metrics, the numbers, right? And, and what can we know, uh, generally speaking, and, and then more specifically about COVID? Well, we know there's about, what, 3.3 million communicable uh, deaths so far this year. Um, you, you know, to give that some context in, in terms of the impact that diseases have, there's about 2.1 million deaths by cancer so far this year. That, that's a lot. Right now, currently we have what just over a million cases of coronavirus. I think it's around the 1.2 million mark, uh, and of those, we're almost at, at 70,000 deaths. And that's where the plot thickens, and, and we'll come back to that. One of the metrics that oftentimes doesn't get spoken to, uh, or is just acknowledged in passing, is the number of recovered cases. Uh, and there's just over 250,000 of those. Right. So if you have somewhere in the order of close to a million active cases, not counting the deaths, um, then a quarter of those are currently recovered. That's very important because what it tells you is that, hey, of all the people who have been diagnosed that haven't died, right, a significant portion, you know, 25% of those are already recovered. Um, And so I think that's uh, important. The, the, The place where the plot thickens is when assessing the deaths, right? Because what, what can we know? What, what can we know by just, you know, logical inference? Well, I think it's close to 70% of deaths are in people over 80 and 50% of the deaths are in people over 70. So, you know, without having a medical degree, without having a background in research sciences, you can know that by, by virtue of the age of that population, um, those guys are going to have comorbidities, obesity, diabetes, uh, cognitive decline, neurodegenerative uh, disease, cardiac disease, and, and cancer. So the question becomes, you know, did those people actually die of coronavirus? And, and you know, in infectiology, there, there's a standard for that. It's, called, it's actually called the Koch standard that was established by a guy named uh, Dr. Robert Koch. Rhymes and, with rhymes with hoax. Right. <laughs> yes, you, you may be onto something there. You may be onto something. And basically what he said was, look, you have to distinguish between infection and disease. So a good example is like, Mark, if you get tested and I get tested and we both get 
flag positive. You guys have coronavirus. You should quarantine yourself. Okay. But if we don't present symptoms, right, if we don't have a high temperature, if we don't have a, a pulmonary compromise, right, then do we have a disease, right? In other words, illness requires a clinical manifestation. And so this is very important when assessing uh, uh, the deaths, right? Have these 67,000 people actually died by COVID-19, yeah. right? I, under I understand, like if someone yeah. had, someone has, uh, they go to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, you have like some tooth decay, but you're like, my tooth feels fine. You, you don't right. have, you, you're not, um, you're not, it's, it's dis-ease, right? So it's, you, you don't have a problem. You have something that could potentially manifest into a problem later on, but it didn't turn into a problem at the moment. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. And so I think that's something that, that, you know, definitely warrants further investigation. And even the numbers themselves, and, and sometimes, you know, if, if your main source of information is CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, or maybe by extension, Facebook, um, one of the things that doesn't oftentimes get addressed is how you get the numbers. So a great example of this is, is a challenge that the CDC has had with some of the numbers coming out of Hubei province in China. And the reason is, is because they changed the standard by which they capture the diagnosis metrics. And here's what I mean by that. They changed from a lab standard to a clinical standard. Here's what that means. If a physician takes a chest X-ray and they see uh, some fluid in the lungs, or they just see some scarring in the lungs, or for example, they take a, uh, an inflammatory blood panel and they say, oh, interleukin-6 is high, then they'll say, that's COVID-19. There's been no laboratory test to, to confirm that. Now, those doctors could be right. But if they're tallying that without a lab test, they're basically counting something which may, in fact, not qualify as a COVID-19 diagnosis. And that's something that recently changed. And if you got 900,000 or so active cases and 15,000 of those uh, are uncertain, in other words, were previously suspected to be coronavirus but unconfirmed, you might think, well, 900,000, 15,000. Yeah, but that's adding jitter into the data. And so these are the things that, you know, the World Health Organization, the CDC, they're negotiating these things. They're, they're trying to figure out, hey, look, do, do we put these in? Do we not what does this mean? Right? And so that... That shouldn't degrade anyone's confidence in the data set as a whole, but it should help people understand that, like, hey, the, when somebody says this many deaths, this many deaths, th these aren't like, you know, uh, uh, biblical re revelations written in stone. These are working numbers that we should have a sufficiently high degree of confidence in, but they're not perfect.